Hello, everybody. In the next lecture, we will now discuss some more aspects of the semiconductor diode. You may recall in the previous lecture, we discussed about the semiconductor diode, different types of diodes like the rectifier diodes, light emitting diodes, photodiodes, wear actor diodes, etc. And then we also see how the light emitting diodes, LEDs can be used for display purposes by using the seven segment display system. We also discussed that in the previous lecture. Diodes are generally specified in data sheets by their maximum forward current ratings and the peak inverse voltage and the continuous power rating. These are the three important specifications of a diode. That is how much current, maximum current I can have under forward bias condition and then what is the maximum inverse voltage that is under reverse bias condition. What is the maximum voltage I can apply across the diode without the diode getting I mean going into the breakdown region. And lastly, what is the power rating of the diode, which these are the three important parameters that we normally obtain from a data sheet of semiconductor diode. Usually the manufacturers will specify all these information in their data sheets. We can also get diodes which have got current ratings from few milliamperes to several amperes. You may recall when I showed some of the diodes, some diodes are very big like a nut and a bolt and they are actually meant for very high currents. There are also diodes which are very tiny, small, you would have seen last time and they are generally meant for small currents of the order of few milliamperes. The barrier potential for a silicon diode, for example, this is about 0.7 volts or 700 millivolts. For a germanium, it is about 0.1 to 0.2 volts. So this barrier potential is also very sensitive to temperature. So whenever we use a semiconductor diode, we should be conscious about this fact that they are very, very sensitive to temperature. So the barrier potential is usually 0.7 volts at around 25 degrees centigrade, which is about room temperature. So if you go beyond room temperature, or when you go below room temperature, the 0.7 can change. How will it change? That is normally expressed as you can see on the screen, the variation of the potential across the diode with temperature which is called delta V by delta T, that is the change in the potential, barrier potential with the change in temperature is given approximately as minus 2 millivolts per degree centigrade. That is, it will vary by 2 millivolts every change when 1 degree of temperature. So now let us just quickly find out what will be the barrier potential as an example, illustrative example at two different temperature, for example, 100 degree centigrade and 0 degree centigrade, which we are very familiar with. So now you can see on the screen, if I take the first case of 100 degree centigrade, you know delta V by delta T is minus T millivolts per degree centigrade. So I, if I, I want to know what is a delta V for a change in temperature which is between 100 degrees and 25 degrees. So minus 2 millivolts into delta T gives me what is a delta V. That delta T in this case is minus 2 millivolts into 100 minus 25 because I want up to 100 degree centigrade and the normal temperature specification is 25 degree centigrade. Therefore, 100 minus 25 is about 75 and 75 into 2 is 150. So you will have minus 150 millivolts or if you express it in volts, it is minus 0.15 volts. So this amount of voltage will be the change in the 0.7 that you think of. Hence, the barrier potential will become 0.7 minus 0.15 which is equal to 0.55. Therefore, you at room temperature 25 degrees centigrade, the voltage across the diode when it is forward biased will be around 0.7 approximately, but the same conditions, under the same conditions, if I increase the temperature 
to 100 degree centigrade, it will not be 0 0.7, but it will be only 0 0.55 volts at 100 degree centigrade. So, similarly now let us work it out for the second temperature which is 0 degree centigrade because I am now going in the opposite direction from 25 degrees delta V is minus 2 millivolts into delta T. Here delta T is 0 minus 25 and therefore there is another minus here coming in. So, when you multiply it is about plus 50 millivolts which is approximately point uh, which is equal to point 0 0.05 volts. So, the voltage of the barrier will vary by plus 0 0.05 when I go down to temperature from 25 degree centigrade to room temperature, room temperature. Therefore, the barrier potential in this case will be 0 0.7 plus 0 0.05 which is equal to 0 0.75 volts. So, when I go down in temperature, the barrier, barrier potential will increase. When I go up in temperature, the barrier potential will decrease. As a matter of fact, this is made use of to measure temperature. That means, a diode can be used as a temperature sensor. A sensor is something which will show us some change when there is a change in temperature or change in pressure, whatever you want. In this case, the barrier potential shows a change whenever there is a change in temperature. Therefore, the diode with forward bias condition can be used as a temperature sensor for measurement of temperature because we have a very clear behavior. As a matter of fact, it is linear, linear. this temperature variation is linear over a very large range of temperatures from about 300 degree uh, Kelvin to about even uh, 40 degree Kelvin and uh, for a silicon diode. Therefore, in low temperature laboratories, you would find semiconductor silicon diodes are used as temperature sensors for measurement of temperature. So, this is one of the very important application of a diode. We let us always, we always consider about ideal devices. So, what will be the ideal nature of a diode? If I take an ideal diode, what it should, how it should behave? What should be its VI characteristics, voltage current characteristics? So, now I have shown on the screen, in an ideal case, you know what the behavior of the diode. When I forward bias, it should conduct completely. When I reverse bias, it should not conduct completely. It should become an insulator. So, that is the ideal characteristic of a diode. Now, that if you see, you can see when the diode is forward biased in the first circuit, there is a voltage source, there is a resistance, there is a current meter and there is a diode here, which is now forward biased and because I assume ideal condition, I take the forward biased diode is fully conducting and therefore, I just connected, replaced it, the diode with a short here. So, if I replace it with a short, it is zero resistance and if it is zero resistance, you can see the voltage across a switch or zero resistance will be zero. So, the voltage across the diode is zero when the diode is an ideal switch and it is on in the forward bias condition and the current will be decided only by this R because that is the only resistance in the circuit. So, I is equal to E by R. So, the current meter here will show you a current which is equal to E by R and there is no voltage across the diode and you get a 0 volts across the diode. So, this line, thick line corresponds to the diode when it is forward biased. There is no voltage across it and the current can be decided by the external resistance only and that is why it keeps on going. If I increase the voltage, current only increases, nothing happens to the voltage across the diode. Now, if I look at the reverse biased diode, then you can see the diode which is acting as an ideal switch is now off because reverse bias the diode offers high resistance. In ideal situation, it offers infinite resistance, therefore, it is a off switch. So, when the switch is off, whatever will be the voltage I apply, that will come across the switch because there is no current flow and therefore, there is no drop across the resistor and the entire voltage E will appear across the diode now and therefore, this voltmeter will read V and this current because it is 0 will read 0. So, that means the voltage will increase as I increase the input voltage, but the current is 0. Therefore, the characteristics of the ideal diode under reverse bias condition should be along the negative x axis. 
negative voltage axis. So, the thick line here shows the reverse bias characteristic of an ideal diode. Therefore, the forward bias is a straight line parallel to the y axis along the y axis and the reverse bias the characteristics is along the negative v axis there is no current and this is a ideal characteristics of a diode, ideal diode. But we never have ideal diode, we all know for example, this is not going like that, there is a slight 0 0.7 volts after that only it increases and it is not straight line here, when the current increases it will go along a slope with a finite slope and therefore, these are non-ideal situations of a normal diode, which is what we normally encounter in all our circuits. Similarly, on the reverse bias direction, the current is not absolute 0, you know there will always be some intrinsic conductivity which is again sensitive to temperature and therefore, you will have very small finite current which is of the order of some micro amperes or nano amperes which will be flowing here and it will not be perfectly 0 in the non-ideal diodes. So, this is what we should remember. I have also shown you the different approximations that you can have for a normal diode. An ideal diode is like a switch I already mentioned to you and the characteristics is something parallel to the y axis along the y axis when it is forward biased and along the negative x axis when it is reverse biased. But this is not the way we get in a forward bias condition uh, because you get some voltage which is the potential across the barrier which I call here V0 and therefore, if I now introduce a battery, DC battery corresponding to the 0 0.7 volts for example, in the case of silicon, then I can assume the normal diode as a first approximation as a voltage source of about 0 0.7 volts connected in series to an ideal diode. When I do that, you find what actually happens is when I forward bias, this vertical line which is going along the y axis will be shifted by the value corresponding to V0 and therefore, I will get a vertical line here that will be the characteristics of the diode under forward bias condition with the first approximation where, where I take into account the potential across the barrier alone. But we also should perhaps take into account the uh, resistance associated with the diode when it is forward biased due to the bulk resistance and therefore, you would find I must include another resistance if I want to make it more closer to the actual diode that we have and therefore, in the next approximation I have introduced a resistor here which is called RF and RF is the forward resistance of the diode and so I have a voltage which is corresponding to the barrier voltage V0 and I have a resistor which is corresponding to the bulk resistance of the diode in the front forward condition and this is the ideal diode. All these three in series can almost approximately resemble the actual diode that we normally come across. You will find that characteristics is like this and in a real case it will just be slowly curling towards this end and it will be coming to the uh, 0 and this is the second approximation of the diode. So, these are very useful when we make use of the diode, you should always remember there is around 0 0.7 volts across the diode. So, it is not as though it is when it is forward biased it is fully conducting, when it is reverse biased it is fully off, it is not like that. We will come across this aspect as we discuss about some of the applications of the diode. Okay, now, we come to the applications. One of the very important primary application of a semiconductor diode is as a rectifier and this you would find is being made use of in several gadgets and applications uh, electronic devices that you come across in daily life. When we require because most of the devices like transistor receiver or a DVD player or a television whatever you have many devices they require a DC voltage of a finite value. Most of the time we require DC voltage as about 6 volts or 12 volts as the case may be. Therefore, how do you get the DC voltage, but you will always remember at home and as office and all that whenever you want a voltage or when you want a device to be operated you immediately put it into the mains plug 220 volts AC and now I am saying we require only 6 volts or 12 volts DC, how do you understand this? The point is this AC volts which is coming to our homes and the office is when I put the plug there is actually a circuit inside the device, a transistor radio or a DVD 
where that will be converted that alternating voltage AC mains 220 volts will be converted into suitable DC of 12 volts or 15 volts or as the case may be. So, in every one of those devices or equipment you will always have a power supply circuit which basically makes use of a diode as a rectifier to convert the AC into suitable level of DC. So, this is one of the very important uh, applications of diode. If you have devices like lamps and fans, you can still have mains directly. So, if in the case of a lamp or a bulb or in the case of a fan, you will just use the 220 volts as such. You do not have to convert them into DC. In all other devices, most of the devices, we have to use AC and convert it into a suitable DC and then only make use of them in our circuit because most of the circuits make use of DC for powering. If that is the case, you may start wondering, I am sure many of you would be having this doubt, why on earth we are having AC mains come to our house? Why not have DC directly? 6 volts you want means let us have the plug coming to our house having an output voltage of 6 volts or 12 volts as the case may be. The, it, the reason is very profound, it is very important because you would find at the source by using a dynamo when I want to de generate electricity in a Heidel project or any atomic power plant or whatever, it is very easy to generate a DC or an AC by a slight modification of the dynamo. You know the difference between a AC dynamo and DC dynamo is not very complex. We can always make them either as DC or as AC. However, from the power plant or from the source where the electricity is generated to the place where it is being used like our houses and other offices and things like that, the distances involved can be several kilometers. And if you want to take electrical energy from the source where it is generated to the place where it is being used, for example, in the houses and offices, you have to run long wires several kilometers. The wires are of course either copper or aluminum wires which have got very good conductivity, they are very good conductors, but still if you consider them over several kilometers, then you can imagine that they will have finite resistance of the order of few hundred ohms for several kilometers. So, therefore, you would find when you have large resistances, when I apply a voltage across that, you know there is going to be heating I square R. That heat is actually energy loss. Apart from that, there will be voltage drop across the resistors. So, when you look at the user center, user end, you would find the voltages will be degenerated. It will come as less voltage, it will not be able to drive some of the appliances that we connect them to. Therefore, transferring AC or DC over long distances is full of uh, losses and therefore, one has to take care of the to make the losses minimum as possible. One way to do that is when you transmit them in alternating mode, AC mode, you can step them up by using simple device which you already I explained to you the final, some of the earlier lectures by using what is known as a transformer. Yes, transformer transforms one AC input to another value of the AC input depending upon the number of turns ratio, the number of turns on the primary and the number of turns on the secondary. The ratio will decide how much will be the output voltage for the AC. So, you have step up and step down transformers possible, you can design them. So, when I step up for example, 220 volts, usually they step up to 22,000 volts or 44,000 volts, things like that. When you increase them to very high tension, very high values of voltages, you would find the total energy is a constant. So, when I increase the voltage, the corresponding current will have to be very, very small. So, at 44,000 and 22,000 volts, the current involved will be very, very small. So, when I send them over long distances through conductors, several kilometers, you would find the losses which are more proportional to I square as you know, the energy loss is I square R, that I square is now going to be very, very small because the currents that we are now talking about are very, very small. Therefore, losses will be minimized. Therefore, there is no other option for us, but to send the voltages from the power plants to the user end only by alternating voltages. 
near our houses we will again have transformers which will transform them back to 220 volts or whatever convenient level and 50 hertz and that is what is given to us in our houses and offices. So, transmission of AC is the most effective and efficient way of transmitting electrical energy to different places, distributing it to different places, but we require for our electronic appliances DC voltages only and therefore, we have to convert the alternating voltage available at our houses and offices into DC voltage of required value and therefore, we require rectifiers. So, now how do we do that? How are we using, how can we use a semiconductor diode for converting AC into DC? Before that, let us just recapitulate some concepts regarding alternating current and voltages. I am sure many of you are already familiar with them. I will just briefly explain to you. For example, on the screen you can see there is a sine wave this is a sinusoidal wave, it is a continuous wave, it keeps on going. I have shown only one period of the sine wave along the time axis and the voltage which is going to the maximum, this is a zero point and there is a maximum here, this voltage is called the peak voltage. This is a peak voltage on the forward condition and this is the peak voltage on the negative cycle and therefore, V i at any instant is given by V p sin omega t. V p is a peak voltage maximum amplitude and sin omega t shows depending upon the time t, the omega is angular frequency depending upon the time t you would find the amplitude can be different. Here the amplitude is only this much, at a later time it is much higher, at the maximum value it is V p when sin omega t is 1 and similarly it keeps decreasing and things like that. So, the voltage is alternating between a plus V p and minus V p in a sinusoidal wave. This is what we get at our house as 220 volts mains. Now, what is the DC component of this? So, if I now connect this output to a DC voltmeter, you know what you would get? You will get a 0 because you find the excursions are both on the positive side and the negative side and the average of this over a cycle is 0. Therefore, V DC which is basically V average is 0 in the case of an alternating voltage. But to measure, but we should have some idea as to how much is the voltage that we have that is obtained by looking at another wave value which is called V RMS. What is V RMS? Voltage root mean square, root mean square voltage. That is what we do is we square the sine wave. When you square the sine wave, the negative also will become positive when you square. And you have sum it over one period and divide by the period then you will get an average over one cycle and take the square root that becomes root mean square. Root means square root, mean means average over period, yes means uh, mean square, no? root mean square. You actually square and take the mean for one period and take the square root that will give me the effective DC voltage which I should apply which will in effect produce the same effect as my DC voltage, AC voltage that I apply. That is the idea behind V RMS and it is given, we all know that V peak by root 2. When you do that for a sine wave, you would find V RMS is equal to V peak by root 2. These things you would have done as exercise in your earlier courses and which is in numerical values is equal to 0 0.707 times V peak where 0 0.707 is actually the value of 1 by root 2. Okay. With this background, let us now look at diode. Now, I have one of the first circuit here. I have an AC input V in and I put a diode and a resistor. Now, I apply a input sine wave. Now, what will happen? You can immediately imagine what will happen. During the positive cycle, the diode will be forward bias and therefore, you will get yeah, across the load RL, you will get the full cycle of the positive excursion of the sine wave. But during the negative off cycle, the diode, this end will become negative, this end will be positive and therefore, the diode will be reverse biased and therefore, it will ideally it should not conduct and therefore, nothing will happen, no current will come and therefore, current will be 0 and the voltage therefore, will be 0. That is what is shown by the gap here on the output. Again, when the next positive cycle comes, it will again, the diode will again conduct, you will get the positive excursion. So, you would find when I give a full sine wave, continuous sine wave at the input of a diode, the, at the output if I measure across the load, you would find you will get only the one half cycles 
each of the half positive half cycles of the sine wave only coming at the output. This is called half wave rectification half of the wave has been rectified and but you should remember there is no negative excursion here. Therefore, it is a unidirectional voltage. The voltage is only in one direction 0 to positive Vp. Maximum can be Vp, but sometimes it can be less than Vp and some other place it can be even 0 because you are uh, during the negative half cycle you get only 0 output. So, this is half wave rectification. Now, if I just interchange the diode in the opposite sense invert the diode you would find the same thing will happen with reference to the negative cycle. So, during the positive cycle the diode will be reverse biased during the negative cycle the diode will be forward biased you can immediately see and therefore, the output will have only the negative excursions of the sign input and this is also called half wave rectification, but it is a other half. Now, I have tried to use a transformer here I have put a transformer so that the 220 volts mains can be reduced some tolerable value for example, 6 volts or 12 volts and then the diode is put and now you can see the half wave rectified output. So, if I have already I have converted the AC into a DC in some sense of course, it is not constant it is varying and therefore, what I will if I connect a voltmeter what I get will be an average voltage. So, for an half wave rectification if I take the average of the half cycle it will be V p by pi and 1 by pi is 0 0.318 and therefore, the V DC the equivalent DC voltage of the half wave rectified output will be about 0 0.3 times the peak voltage that is what it is very very small 0 0.3 times only 30 percent of the voltage is available as the uh, DC voltage. Now, if I have just taken a simple example if I use a transformer 20 is to 1 that means, 20 is to 1 is a turns ratio on the input side it is 20 at the output side it is 1 with, with a 220 volts RMS they should be decreased by the same ratio 20 is to 1 and at the frequency is 50 hertz. So, the secondary output will be 220 divided by 20 because it will be reduced by 20 times and that will be 11 volts RMS that is what I will get at the output. So, what will be the peak voltage in that case? The peak voltage will be 11 divided by root 2 V p by root 2 uh, uh, no the RMS. So, peak voltage is multiplied by root 2 therefore, it is equivalent to dividing by 0 0.707 which is 15.5. Therefore, from the RMS value when you go to peak value it will be more than the RMS value it is 15.5 volts when I have an RMS of 11 volts and the V D C is 0.318 times 15.5 V peak and therefore, that corresponds to about 4.9 volts only. The peak voltage is 15.5, but what you get as an average D C is only 4.9 volts you are losing enormously there. So, if you now come across a load we should remember the across the load the voltage is not just 4.9, but less the 0.7 volt which was taken away by the diode when it is forward biased and therefore, 4.9 minus 0.7 is 4.2 volts this will be the voltage that I will get at the output of a half wave rectifier. Let me just take one simple simulation experiment now let me move on to the full wave rectifier. So, if one diode can rectify one half of the wave then you can imagine immediately then if I cleverly use two diodes maybe I will be able to get both the half cycles on the same side. The trick that we play is to use a transformer with a center tap. What do you mean by a center tap? When you wind the secondary of the transformer at the center of the turns if I have 200 turns after 100 turns I will take extra one lead from the uh, coil and then continue to turn another 100 turns. So, you will have equal number of turns on either side of the center tap and now you would find when I apply a input voltage to the primary with reference to the center tap the two ends of the secondary can be in opposite phase. If I take this as my reference 0 then this will be plus with reference to 0 for one half cycle and this will be at that time minus. During the next half cycle this end B end will become plus and the A end will become minus. So, you can have the polarity changed plus and minus with reference to the center and therefore, this can be used cleverly 
to make a full wave rectifier by using two diodes that is what is shown in the figure here. You have one diode connected to one end A of that secondary and the other end is connected to another diode and the both of them are connected together and the load is connected between that point and the center tap. If you do that you would find when the positive excursions is are coming this end will become positive and therefore this diode will conduct and you will get a positive half cycle corresponding to the diode D1 conducting that is what is shown here. When the excursion is negative at the input then correspondingly the secondary voltage will also go negative at the A but at the B it will be now positive because they are 180 degrees out of phase A and B. Because it is now positive this diode will start conducting during that negative cycle and therefore the output will still come in the same direction across the load the direction of current will be the same and therefore the voltage due to D2 will be again positive and it will be as shown in the figure. So for each of the half cycle each of the two diodes will work alternately to conduct and therefore you get a full wave rectifier. That means you have converted the entire AC into a unidirectional DC voltage. When you do that if you take the average it was peak V peak by pi for the half wave rectifier and therefore for full wave rectifier which has got two such things coming together you will have VP 2 VP by pi 2 times you should get and that corresponds to 2 times 0 0.318 uh, 6, uh, that is equal to 0.636 times the peak voltage. So the DC average of a full wave rectifier has now doubled it is twice the value that you got for the previous case and if I now take the same example of 20 is to 1 transformer with a 220 volts RMS input with 50 hertz the secondary output is continued to be 11 volts with the center tap there and therefore 11 volts by 0 0.707 which is the peak voltage is 15.5 which is also the value we got in the previous time but now VDC is 0.63 times 6.36 times 15.5 therefore it is 9.8 that means it has doubled up from the previous value and the V load will be 9.8 minus 0 0.7 where the 0 0.7 is the forward voltage across the diode and therefore it comes to around 9.1 volt. So you can see when I use a full wave rectifier I am able to get much higher DC voltage than I have got for the half wave rectifier. So this helps us to make a better power supply DC power supply unidirectional power supply. So this is a full wave rectifier I hope I can show the full wave rectifier as a okay never mind. Now let me move on the, to the third type of rectifier which is called a bridge rectifier. In this you can see I am going to use not two diodes but four diodes as you can see on the screen I have four diodes D1, D2, D3 and D4 they are connected in the form of a bridge and you have the input sine wave coming in through the primary and the secondary voltage will uh, be somewhat smaller in value for example 6 volts or 12 volts and that is connected to this type of a V stands bridge type of a connection but you must be very careful with reference to the orientation of the diodes. The diodes will have to be connected exactly in this form then only it will work correctly. If you invert any of the diode it will not work properly. Now the output is taken the input is given to one two ends of the distance network and the output is taken from the other two opposite ends. So you can see the output voltage here will again be a full wave rectifier. So it is very similar to the full wave rectifier that we saw earlier only difference is in that case I use only two diodes and I use the center tap transformer whereas in this case there is no center tap and there is uh, there are four diodes which are being used but the effective output is the full wave rectified output and that means it is again 0 0.636 times the peak voltage that is what I will get. So now if I take the same example of 20 is to 1 transformer and calculate in this case the peak voltage will continue to be 15.5 volts but when I now use 0 0.63 times VP because it is a full wave rectifier I should multiply by 0 0.636 15.5 that corresponds to 9.8 which is also the same as the case that we had in the previous situation and therefore the load voltage now we have to be very careful. Why? When 
when I see what is happening here is when I connect the transformer and connect it to the mains when this P end is positive you will find the current will flow in this direction and then it will go in this direction. That means th this diode will be forward biased and this diode also will be forward biased and therefore there are two diodes which are forward biased for one half wave. For the other half similarly these two diodes will be forward biased. Therefore you find in the case of a full wave full bridge rectifier bridge rectifier I should not subtract 0.7 volts here as I did in the previous case but 1.4 volts because there are two diodes coming in series for the each of the half cycle and therefore 9.8 minus 1.4 is 8.4 volts only across the load. So some voltage is lost during the rectification due to the voltage drop across the diodes and what I get across the load will be much less than about 0.7 volts less than what I would normally get in the case of a pure uh, full wave rectifier with a center tap transformer. Now I will let me compare the three different types of rectifiers that we discussed. So if I take the half wave, full wave and bridge you can see the number of diodes used in a half wave is only one diode. In the case of full wave I used two diodes and in the case of bridge rectifier I used four diodes. The input is Vp in the one case, in the first case in the half wave. In the full wave because I use a transformer, a center tap transformer it is only 0.5 times the Vp and in the case of bridge rectifier there is no center tap therefore it is a full Vp and the peak input is Vp minus 0.7 in the half wave rectifier. In the full wave rectifier it is 0.5 times Vp minus 0.7 and in the case of bridge rectifier Vp minus 1.4 volts. Similarly if I look at the DC voltage in the half wave rectifier it is Vp by pi and in the full wave rectifier it is 2 times Vp by pi because it is two half waves which are coming together and in the bridge rectifier also it is two times Vp by pi. Now the most important point with reference to frequency is in the case of half wave you are having only one wave coming for every full wave and therefore the frequency does not change in the half wave rectifier. But if you come to the full wave you find both the halves are coming and therefore the frequency will be correspondingly doubled. I do not know whether you see that perhaps I will go back here and show you the uh, figure. If you see on this figure the full wave rectifier you can say this is corresponding one half wave, this is corresponding to another half wave, this corresponding so that this for the next cycle. So in one cycle you have two humps maximum Vp and another Vp and therefore if I look at this as a variation you can see the frequency of the variation is now twice for every one cycle there are two humps which are coming and therefore the frequency of the alternating uh, component in this will be twice the frequency of the applied and therefore you will have 50 in, if I apply 50 hertz I will have 100 hertz for a full wave rectifier. It is true both in the case of full wave rectifier and in the case of bridge rectifier which is also another form of full wave rectification. So these are the important points that we should always remember with reference to rectifier. So I have shown here what actually what we require. What we require is we want to generate a DC voltage from the AC mains that means ultimately I must have a voltage for example V1 which is constant with reference to time. So when I this is what we want ultimately when I want to energize any of my equipment or device I require a constant DC voltage that is what a battery or dry cells which we use normally in some of the devices provide. They provide a constant 1.5 or 6 volts as the case may be. In the same way using the DC AC mains if I convert using diode as rectifier I must also get a similar constant DC voltage. But we have seen when we do a full bridge rectifier, a full wave rectifier, I get a waveform which is continuously changing. It is not constant. The value of the voltage is continuously changing like this. And that means I can always consider this as your average DC which is about 0.6 times the VP plus a small AC component which is due to these humps that we get which has got a frequency which is twice the applied frequency in this case 100 hertz. So you can see this output which I now get from a full wave rectifier has got two components 
one is a constant DC and the other is a ripple voltage which is an AC component superposed on the DC and that is what I have shown in this figure. So if you want to achieve this constant DC voltage situation then you must somehow get rid of this AC component. You must filter the AC component and retain only the DC component. So there are number of filters available and one of the very simple scheme is to use a capacitor. You know the basic behavior of a capacitor is that it blocks DC and it will uh, pass AC. Therefore now if I put a capacitor in the way I have shown on the circuit across the load then what will happen whenever I get rectified output the AC component will be passed through the capacitor whereas the DC component will not be passed and therefore what I have will be a pure DC. Some of the AC component would have gone through the AC or through the capacitor. So that is what shown in the graph by the side. This is the input which is going to a peak value and what I will get after the capacitor when I put the capacitor is like this. That means if the capacitor is charged to the full peak value and then when the voltage drops at the input the capacitor cannot discharge because it has got a resistor here it can discharge only at a very steady rate depending upon the RC time constant of the capacitor and the load and therefore that will make the discharge very very slow and therefore it slowly discharge and before it comes to zero the next pulse positive pulse will come and it will again take the voltage across the capacitor to peak and therefore you find this reduction in the AC component can be very easily seen here and therefore you would find the AC component or the ripple component of the output in the will become very very small the moment I use a capacitor. And depending upon the value of the capacitor you can make this DC much closer to the value that I wanted constant value. So if I use a very large capacitor for example I will get almost very low ripple and therefore it will be a reasonably constant DC output. If I use a small capacitor the ripple component only small amount of ripple component will be removed and therefore you still have some ripple component which is larger in the output. So this is for the half wave case. What will happen if I go for the full wave case? You will find in the case of full wave it will be much better because the average itself is very high and therefore the uh, voltage across the diode can never be go below the average DC and therefore you will have much smaller ripple content. Now how do we calculate the ripple factor which is one of the very important uh, or the peak voltage of the ripple. The peak voltage peak to peak ripple voltage is for a capacitor input filter is given by VR is equal to 1 by yeah, I by FC. I is the current DC current load current and F is the frequency and C is the capacitance that I have used. So I by FC gives me the ripple peak ripple voltage with some approximation and therefore we will be in a position to calculate what is a peak to peak ripple voltage in the case of a simple shunt capacitor filter. There are different configurations of the filter. You can have a pi section filter, you can have LC filters with inductances and you can have pi section LC filters and things like that. There are different varieties but because we are handling very low voltages, a simple capacitor filter will itself be very, very good and useful. So in this case, I have got a load current. I assume a load current of 20 milliamperes and the frequency is 100 hertz for a full wave rectifier and if I assume 500 microfarad capacitor then the V peak to peak ripple will be 20 milliampere I by F which is 100 hertz C is 500 mega microfarad and this when you calculate it will be around 0.4 with voltage peak to peak. So the peak voltage will be 0.2 half of this and V RMS of the peak ripple will be V peak peak by 2 root 2. The 2 comes because we are taking the peak to peak voltage. What we actually require is a peak voltage and therefore there is a division by 2 and the root 2 comes because you want the RMS. So VP by root 2 is RMS. So VP is VPP by 2 and therefore you have VPP by 2 root 2 here. So you would find this will be a very very small value of the order of few millivolts and therefore we have almost 
convert that alternating voltage into a reasonably constant DC voltage with very small ripple component. Now let me go and show you some of these in the experiment and I will show you a half wave rectifier, a full wave rectifier with a center tap transformer and a full wave rectifier with a bridge rectifier and then I will also show you the with the capacitor input how the ripple content is reduced to a very low value. Now I have a transformer with the two leads coming here. I will connect that to the output of uh, oscilloscope. Now you can see the output of the transformer is a full wave sinusoidal wave. Okay. Now I take that input and connect it to a simple off wave rectifier. You can see there is a diode here, there is a resistor here and one end of the transformer is connected here, the other end of the transformer is connected at the diode and the voltage across the uh, resistor which is a load resistor is now connected across to the oscilloscope. So one end of the resistor is connected to one end of the oscilloscope, the other end is connected to the ground and you can see the output is half wave rectified. You can see the output is half wave rectified and because I have used one diode, this is what we already saw. Now if I do the next circuit here, I have is a full wave rectifier, you have got two diodes and the resistor is connected. So now I should take the transformer with the center tap and connect it to the two end. I will just do that now. So now I have connected one end of the transformer here, the other end of the transformer at this point and the center tap is the yellow which is connected to the ground and I measure the output voltage using the oscilloscope. You can see the full wave rectifier, you can see the full wave rectifier output here when I have two diodes on the center tap transformer. The next experiment I will just use the bridge rectifier, you can see the circuit is already wired here with the output connected to the oscilloscope. And now I connect the transformer Now I have connected one end of the transformer to this end, the other yellow end to the bottom and I have taken the voltage across the resistor. You can see again there is a full wave rectifier, rectified output here, both the off cycles. So this is corresponding to the one pair of diode, this is corresponding to the other pair of diode. So this is again full wave rectified output. Now I will just show you uh, the same experiment using light emitting diodes. Here. I have the bridge formed with four light emitting diodes and the output also I have connected the diode and this is an oscillator. So I will just switch on the oscillator. Now I have switched on the oscillator and kept it at square wave, okay, this is a square wave and at very low frequency 1 hertz. So this is again a bridge rectifier except instead of normal diode I am using light emitting diodes here and the output also is connected to the diode. Now you can immediately because it is a light emitting diode whenever they conduct they show the color whether it is green or blue. Now I have used two red corresponding to the one part of the bridge and two green LEDs for the other part for the output I have connected one red LED. So now you can see that these two LEDs are glowing for some time and these two LEDs are glowing for the other time. This is for one off cycle, this is for the other, other off cycle but all the same this diode is always on. That means for both orientations this current is always in the same direction. So the load current is the same but that these two pairs of diodes will conduct alternately to make the output continuously come through the load. This is exactly the full wave rectification but with a bridge rectification shown with light emitting diode. 
So, before I conclude, I will just show you the rectification with the capacitor filter, only one experiment. Uh, circuit I will show you. Now, I have the same bridge rectifier with the two ends of the transformer connected to the bridge and the output in along with the resistor, I have connected a capacitor of about 100 microfarad. Now, the output are connected to the uh, oscilloscope. You can see here the charging and discharging of the capacitor corresponding to every uh, pulse of the uh, so you can see it is charging and then slowly it is discharging and then again the next pulse comes charging and discharging this is what i showed you in the figure when i talked about it and therefore this actually and the, if you look at the dial the voltage will be very very small so the ripple content after i filter this peak to peak voltage is going to be very very small it is approximately of the order of 0.1 volt for division therefore it is about 0.1 volt that means 100 millivolts. So when I, I have an output of about 15 volts so I have a ripple of only 0.1 volt and that means the uh, capacitor has completely discharged I mean uh, connected all the AC down and therefore what comes out is almost a pure DC volts and this is the full wave rectifier with a capacitor filter. So, so far what we have seen is how a diode can be used as a rectifier for converting AC voltage into DC voltage. We saw three different circuits, a half wave rectifier which makes use of only one diode and a full wave rectifier which is of the two types. One with a center trap transformer, you can have two diodes and make the full wave rectifier or also you can use a bridge configuration of the diodes and make use of the full wave rectifier. And when you do have some AC component in the output which is called a ripple and the ripple can be eliminated by using a shunt capacitor filter, capacitor input filter and thereby you would be able to reduce the AC component in the DC output to a very small value of the order of millivolts. So this way you will be able to construct a DC power supply from the AC mains voltage. But this if you want still constant voltage you have to use what is known as voltage regulators. We will perhaps see some of those circuits at a later time with that you will be able to get almost ripple free DC voltage at the output and that is what we normally have in many of our uh, equipment and devices. So this is a very useful application of the diode. There are other applications of the diode which you will also see especially in wave shaping, clippers and clampers. We will see some of these circuits in the next lecture and also we will see how the diode by a special type of diode called a Zener diode can be used for voltage regulation purposes. That Zener diode is used only in the reverse biased direction and that is very useful for regulation applications. We will see that in the next lecture. Thank you.